من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وصلي عليه في الأولين وفي الآخرين وفي الملأ الأعلى يا رب العالمين um, We always begin uh, the Quranic study as the Quran has taught us seeking refuge with God from the cursed Satan and we begin in his glorious name and all of his qualities and characteristics uh, primarily that of him being compassionate, beneficent, merciful, kind, caring, giving, all of these wonderful qualities that fit under the concept of Rahmah. So we praise in gratitude the Lord of the universe, we exalt and glorify his name, uh, and we ask him to send his peace and blessings and mercy upon his final messenger, Muhammad, that he sent so that mankind could realize the finality of the Abrahamic covenant, and that they could uh, attain the ultimate bliss of a connection to God for eternity. We have been talking about for the last uh, many weeks the different levels of people in regard to how do they relate to God. And so there are three categories. Who can tell me the first category? Um in the history of mankind, yes, most people were disbelievers, unfortunately. And so this uh, is the second mentioned in the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is a book of guidance addressing those who are seeking guidance. So, uh, when God opens up his book answering the prayer, guide us to the straight path, he says, this is the book, there's no doubt about it, it is guidance for those who are mindful of their Lord. So then it gives all these qualities and characteristics. They believe in the unseen prayers, regularly established, giving, charitable mindset, selfless compassion. Uh, they believe in scripture. God has been revealing his message throughout history. There's a special covenant with Abraham. And then we believe with certainty that we will die and be resurrected. And then the weight of our soul is connected to the sincerity of actions and words that we're seeking to please God versus good things that you did but was for your own benefit in this world, you don't gain spiritual worth like that. You gain popularity in the world. You see a lot of these philanthropists and so forth. The question is, where is their heart? Um, so God knows what's in the heart. So then he addresses disbelief. The disbelievers are people that have chosen to not connect to God or they are arrogant about their understanding of God. They're not looking to broaden their horizons. They assume... Uh, culturally that the way I was born must be right simply because that's the way of my forefathers and so the Quran is very uh, strong in its rebuke about following forefathers for the sake of forefathers and so then it goes into the complicated reality of hypocrisy and so you have five verses dealing with faith and belief and mindfulness of God seeking the guidance and then you have two verses that just sum up people who say I disbelieve their heart has inclined God shuts them off from seeing the truth until their heart changes. That's it. Hypocrisy is this kind of fluctuation or different levels of disbelief mixed with different levels of belief or a complete game with oneself or one society. So he goes into all of these qualities and characteristics and so today we're going to talk about how he concludes the story of the hypocrisy with a parable. And uh, we have our guest here, Corby, today. Uh, Nice to have you. So as a student of the Bible, wouldn't you say that throughout the Bible you find parables and stories that give you an analogy? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, you'll see that throughout Scripture. You'll see it even in Hindu Scriptures and Buddhist Scriptures. You're going to see parables. Such and such is like the story of such and such. And so sometimes they're very deep and eloquent and it takes a lot of like some of the things we're going to look at today. You might leave here going, I'm still not sure exactly what that meant. Right? And so we have many great scholars who've assessed certain things in the Qur'an. Um, and then there are some that are more overt and common, and we're going to try to leave you with that. That you will see that here's what that means, and here's what that means to me. It would be very dangerous for a person to say, I'm a believer, and there's no hypocrisy, and I could never be a hypocrite because, alhamdulillah, I'm a believer. This is what we call ghurur fiddin. This is being fooled by religiosity in that one assumes perfect level of faith that it's constant. 
And the scriptures and the vast majority of scholars throughout our history have said that faith, faith is fluctuating. It goes up and down. Circumstances, environments, people, thoughts, uh, all of those things will affect people's faith. So hypocrisy comes with low faith. So we should always be careful to avert ourselves from hypocrisy. So we talked a little bit about this last week, but we're going to review it because it's the beginning of the parable. It talks to, so we said the hypocrites are those that, particularly those in the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in Medina, they were settled in Yathrib, the city. And they had strong ties with their tribes. Tribalism was the system. And they had some economic interest with their Jewish neighbors. And so here comes these this, for example, young teenage boy named Musab, and he's reading Quran and preaching what Islam is as a missionary, and these great elders amongst the society are starting to embrace this new religion. And so some people are looking back and like, what's this? Then they welcome the Prophet and some 200 some believers to migrate from Mecca to be embraced in Yathrib. And by the time they came, some months after that, that was a welcomed uh, argument, you know, like, okay, now we've decided as leaders of this society, we're welcoming these, and we're going to elect Muhammad, peace be upon him, the prophet, as our leader of our society, because now majority of the tribal reality is, is now embracing this religion, or at least the elders. So, basically, these people are taking a step back, and so they're keeping their interest and their benefit from their tribal connections, and some of them had some, you know, uh, aspirations about what they were wanting to achieve. Like Abdullah bin Ubay, the leader of all of the hypocrites. And then you had some that had very strong financial interests with the Jewish community that had been living in there for some time, waiting for the Prophet as they had said. So, So, in Arabic, literally, those are the ones who have... Uh, they have their, they have some guidance, and so they sell it for misguidance. So they're trying to take a benefit from misguidance at the expense of guidance. So they have bought delusion in exchange for misguidance. We're choosing this term delusion because they were kind of, they were really thinking strongly that this thing's not going to last, right? So they left the faith that was given to them innately. See, what one group of scholars might say about why faith is mentioned first in the Qur'an, the vast majority of mankind, and we're talking 90 plus percentile in its history, have believed in a creator, a supreme being. If you look in any language on earth, all of the children of Adam have a word that describes supreme being, the all-knowing, all-powerful creator, right? That's a concept. I mean, many people say, well, India is a pretty big place to have a billion people. There's something called Brahman. For them, Brahman is like the essence of all, right? The top of all. Uh, it's not too active, so we interact with this Vishnu, Shiva, and all these others they've invented. And so, uh, but they do have this concept. Some of them, uh, actually, technically, the religion is pantheistic. So... If you get into a conversation with your Christian neighbor or friend, they're going to be confused. And they'll admit it readily, humbly, m most of them. Because it's a hard thing to defend. Well, you know I believe in the Trinity, but, you know, God created everything. Did Jesus create everything? Well, not really, but those are like the same. But, the, you know, they'll get confused for, on this one. I have a hard time explaining it. Um, so you will have this um, essence of innate faith. And it goes back to an ayah in the Qur'an where God said He gave awareness to all creations. And then He said, which one of you would take on the trust of being responsible? The human being said, I've got it. Everything else, mountains, stars, suns, everything in the heavens and the earth said, no. I don't want to have to be responsible, therefore I could make mistakes and be selfish and then I end up in the hellfire. They, they understood this, what the question was about. Do you want to be your own individual making your own choices and thus responsible for right and wrong? Or do you want to just be programmed and not be consciously aware of yourself but part of the whole thing? They said, we like the part of your whole thing and not conscious. The human being said, I'll take consciousness. I like that. I, don't, I haven't met a person yet that said, I wish I wasn't 
created, unless they have like clinical depression, which is a sickness. Then there's another ayah that says that God creates every soul and then awakens it in heaven. It says, am I your Lord? And the soul says, of course, all the soul knows is this is the only thing I know is this one asking me. And so whatever it's asking, obviously, there's no other, I don't know anything else at this point. And so then he puts that soul with the angel, goes and puts it in the mother's womb. So everybody comes out believing in, in a supreme being. So it's there. So these people, they're leaving that innate faith. And now through prophethood, which has come to them. So prophethood comes with miracles. You know, um, I had a discussion with a Mormon friend once. And I'm impressed with Mormons. As a people, they're probably one of the most devout, disciplined, good well-being Christians as a generality. Your average Mormon is a very upstanding person. And so, I mean, modern secular liberalism is slowly hacking away at their <laughs> essence as it is everybody else, but they're there. But I got into this debate about uh, Joseph Smith. The one they're saying is the prophet that was alluded to in the New Testament when John the Baptist was being questioned about the prophet. Now, we know the prophet is Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. They think it's Joseph Smith. That's, who they, that's what they know, right? So then I asked him, I said, so what kind of miracles did he per perform? And he said, well, he was given golden tablets from heaven, in heavenly language. I said, did anybody see that? He said, no. He translated them into English. I said, what did he do with them? Some said that they went up to heaven. Some said that he buried them somewhere. We have all these different groups saying stuff about what happened to the golden tablets of the Book of Mormon, which is like the final testament of God to mankind. So we have to trust this guy, right? <laughs> it's the same problem I have with Paul. Paul is really the founder of Christianity. What is Paul? They're saying he did some miracles, but historical fact would have a hard time with that. Um, so for me, when you look at the Prophet Muhammad or any other prophet, you see outstanding miracles that broke the laws of nature, that everybody was increased in faith, or because of their obstinate rebellion, they said, he's a magician. They said it to Moses, they said it to Jesus. They're saying that this is a the work of magic. Because they don't want to believe. As we said before, in al kafaru, doesn't matter what happens to a disbeliever. If they see anything, they will stick with their disbelief. Because that's what they've chosen. No matter what signs are shown to them, they can't see it till their heart inclines to see it. So these hypocrites, they are born with faith, and then now a prophet has come to them with revelation. It's the ultimate treasure of complete value that nothing else could value an iota of this value and yet they're thinking but I have these tribal ties and these uh, you know business deals I do with these Jewish caravans and things like that maybe I should just hold off on all this prophethood some scholars they broke it down well they were believers and then they were not believers that's a whole polemic thing فَمَا رَبِحَتْ تِجَارَتُهُمْ وَمَا كَانُوا مُحْتَدِينَ so their transaction did not benefit them. It did not profit them. And they were not guided. These are the hypocrites. <laughs> Ladies, you don't bite back there. Okay, just making sure there's no biting back there. It's an English phrase for like, not bother you. Okay. So the reality here now is they were thinking We've had tradition here for a thousand years. We're Arabs. We have all these idols. These Jews have been around for thousands of years. They know this stuff. They know about prophethood. We don't have prophethood in our society. We have these old stories of Abraham and Ishmael that are, for them, at that point, it became like mythology, like Thor and Zeus. To them, it's some old story. It's not relevant. They have these idols. That's what's real to them. So the Arabs are saying in Yathrib, this thing will die over. It will, it will go away. This Islam, this new religion that's invading our society, it's in the Surat al-Munafiqun. Anybody know the, the particular ayah? يَقُولُونَ لَئِنْ رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلِ so it's one of the, some groups of hypocrites, they said, 
when they were on a traveling mission and it looked like there was some dispute between some of the people from Yathrib and some of the, which we call the Ansar, the helpers, and some of the Meccan uh, Muslims from Quraysh. So they said, when we get back to Medina, surely the noble Yathrib Aus and Khazraj, we will get rid of these foolish, lowly people who got kicked out of their land and lost all their real value by leaving the way of their forefathers. So, Al-Izzah Lillahi wa li Rasulihi wa lil Mu'mineena wa lakinna al-Munafiqeena la yafqahun. Dignity is for a true person connected with God and faith and belief and uh, for the messenger and for the message. Uh, the hypocrites don't realize that. Now when this verse was being revealed, Muslims were under the gun. There were groups from around Medina plotting to destroy the Muslims. The Muslims had lost a battle. And the Quraysh are still a very dominant tribe with huge uh, alliances, tahaluf, in Qaba'al al-Arab. Many of the other tribes in the Arabian Peninsula are very uh, connected financially and spiritually through the uh, control over the Kaaba. So, here's what's interesting. The verse, if you see the last point here, it seems to be referring to the hereafter, which many scholars said that. Uh, but it's miraculously rang true in this world, because Islam became dominant and then thrived up until now all over the world. I mean, maybe we're not thriving now, but we're in a low point. It's coming back by the fact of history as well as by the prophetic legacy. Everything he's told us has come true, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we know, this dark ages we're in right now, we will come out of it. So here's what's interesting. These hypocrites were betting their soul and their worldly interests that this religion is going to come and go. And religions have come and gone all over the earth, big time, in many places. Islam not only became the standard, the norm in Medina, but in all of Arabia, and for a third of the known civilized world, for now many, many centuries. The hypocrites don't realize this. So... This is where we see um, how true faith is to realize history and how it will come back. So here's where the, the parable of the day comes. They're like a people who have kindled a fire. So the scholar said lighting the fire is like their open claims to faith because fire will give you warmth and comfort. And it will give you sight. You can see clearly. So they're saying the lighting of the fire is like having the Prophet come, seeing him and saying we believe in him, going to the mosque and praying. Seeing Muslims, learning about morality, seeing the beauty of it. So now it's all around them. It's in Medina. The whole city of Medina is believers. ذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِنُورِهِمْ وَتَرَكَهُمْ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ اللَّهِ يُبُصِرُونَ so then God takes away their light, leaving them in darkness where they cannot see. Deaf, dumb, and blind, summum bukmun umum fahum la yarji'un. Deaf, dumb, and blind, they will not return. So, the scholars, they talked about this. They said, leaving them blind in the darkness is like while they benefit from it in many ways. They lose its value since it will not guide them. As we said, the famous parable is, is standard here. Not the famous parable. It actually will happen. On the day of judgment, there is this bridge. And the believers will have light coming forth from them because of the sincerity and the actions and the faith that they have. And as they're going over this uh, bridge, they feel like it's easy and comfortable and they can move very fastly. And so then the hypocrites don't have the light because it was all fake. It wasn't real spirituality. It was just going along for worldly interests. 
So it's like the people who do things without sincerity. Maybe, like, you have this modern thing now where people are like, oh, I want to do good because that's what good, what it, what it means to be good. Well, for us, this concept of Tawheed, mon pure monotheism, it's this predicated thought process or philosophy that I am a servant of God. I am doing what I do to please God in generality. Until I find that I've done something displeasing to Him, at which point, to continue seeking His favor, I ask His forgiveness and repent to Him. So our whole life as a Muslim, the word literally means one who submits to God. See, in the modern secular liberal world, Muslim is like a statistic of people from, you know, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Pakistan, Sudan, Somalia. You know, it's, like a, it's just like a, it's like an ethnic type thing. The word Muslim means one who submits to the will of God. So for the Muslim, I'm constantly trying to cultivate sincerity, and when I found I broke from that, I maintained sincerity by asking forgiveness. So then even the bad things I did were good. This is what we're taught in the Qur'an. Yubaddullah sayyatim hasanat. Right? So the hypocrite is like, they have problems in their sincerity. They're doing things for the worldly value. See, if you say you gave this much money in the fundraiser and you went and did, fed people at the homeless shelter and you even prayed these prayers and all that, but at the end of the day it was to please people. You were looking for comfort and acceptance and gratitude from people. That was your aim. That was your primary intention. So you will not on the day of judgment see some sort of spiritual worth. You will not see the light. You will not be in a good state. Hypocrites there in this one. So lighting, lighting the fire is their open claim to it. Allah taking it, He leaves them blind. In the hereafter, they will be void of benefit. Others noted that they were in dark. They were in the darkness. Then they lit up the fire. And the fire went out, and so they were lost. Just talking about the nature of hypocrisy. Light, lost. Light, lost, light, lost. And the Qur'an tells us, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفْرُوا ثُمَّ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ كَفْرُوا ثُمَّ آمَنُوا ثُمَّ ازْدَادُوا كُفْرًا لَمْ يَكُنِ اللَّهُ لِيَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ وَلَا لِيَهْدِيَهُمْ سَبِيلًا The Qur'an talks about people who believe and disbelieve and believe and disbelieve. That's why people on the spiritual journey should never allow worldly things and influences to challenge ultimate faith. Because why? Faith is not connected to the world. It's not. The world is material. Faith is spiritual. Spiritual is something that is cultivated mystically. There are people who follow self-help books. There are great Buddhist people. But they don't have a belief in God. They're very good people. I'll be dead honest with you. They're super patient. They are amazingly in control of their character. And you would be with them and you'd be like, these people are amazing. But it has nothing to do with spirituality. Real spiritual, I mean I'm God. I mean, now everybody's saying you can be spiritual and not believe in God. Have you heard about this? Well, like, this is blowing my mind with how we're going with things right now. I'm a very spiritual person. Oh really? What religion do you follow? Well, I'm an atheist. Hold on, hold on. I'm a humanist spiritual person. So what does spiritual mean? Well, there's something about life that we don't know yet, and it's interesting. There is a science called theology that you really should study. So, uh, other scholars, they're saying this is referring to people who believed upon the Prophet's arrival, and then they were fooled by hypocrisy. And this is, what, this is the point we're going to talk about, because it's very much relevant to us. Others said it's the process of being around people with faith, the light, lighting the fire, and then you're away from those people. Now you're around non-Muslims. You're around Muslims who don't practice. And some people think it's a matter of Americans or non-Americans. It's not. You'll be around people who are born and raised Muslim that are so harmful to your spirituality. It's just like unbearable. It doesn't matter where you were born. It matters where your heart is. Right? So you'll meet some people who are like, I believe in God. I don't really believe Jesus is God or the Son of God. I believe that we should be countable. Are you a Muslim? I don't know about all that yet. Just these people, you'll be around them, you'll be like, wow, man. These people are like Muslim, right? You'll be around Muslims talking about, I don't believe in jinn, dude. Why? Because I don't, the evil eye, I don't believe in it. I just, I don't see it, right? 
But based on what? Well, because we don't see it. Okay, so you're using a material world to challenge religiosity. That's why the prophets did the miracles. That's why we started with this. It's not something that is just a theory. It was proven. Very strongly in world history, the prophets were sent by the one who controls the laws of nature, the Creator. It's very simple. It's an ABC123 thing. So, um, and then those who engage in faith, they, they will feel a presence. They will, you know, sometimes you've been like praying for something a lot and it just didn't pan out, and then one day it pans out. And then you feel it, and then there's something that you feel about it. Sometimes you were praying for something that seemed like it would never happen. It's impo impossible. And then it happens exactly as you were praying for it. Like I'll never forget one time. A kid in a school where I used to live was running with a pencil in the school. Tripped and fell and it went into his brain through his eye socket. Two inches. Now, this is a dead kid, right? So, I, got, I was in Michigan at the time studying. And I heard from his father that my son is in very bad condition in ICU. He has severe brain damage and all of this. So, we were praying, they were praying, everybody's praying. Medically, the doctor said he may recover. High probability he will be never using that eye. He will be majorly vegetative. He may not have good decision making. I'm telling you because I know the guy. His name is Muhammad Khattab. He is in medical school right now. And he is in fully functional with some minor motor skills that have been taken from him. Although he can go out and play soccer and basketball with deep, you know, participation in uh, competition. You can't imagine how... Medicine says, medicine has admitted time. If you meet doctors, particularly like surgeons and others, they'll say, many times things happen. I studied and did this my whole life. I'm a doctor. I'm a scientist. What has happened here goes against everything we know. It's just something we don't know. And so that's where faith is something that you have to seek it, and then it will come to you and it will make sense more and more. The more you cultivate it, the more it flourishes within you. Hypocrisy is where that's not your mission in life. And then you get around some people that are not with Islam. It blew my mind. And I know some of our brothers in the community don't like this. But I met Muslims, they're like, I'm supporting Trump. I'm like, hold on, bro. No, 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 he just calling it like it is. You know, he's going to fix the economy. I was like, brother, hold on, hold on. There is no way, as a, not even as a Muslim, let's not say Muslim, as a moral, intelligent person, that you're going to support this guy unless you are going along with the brainwashing of one particular agenda called the conservative right-wing agenda, which is a political movement that is brainwashing people through Fox News and through whatever their politicians say. Because they're telling you that we're good white Christian folk and we don't believe in abortion and we're against gay marriage. The puppeteering effect, right? Come to find out he has really good friends that are pro-Trump. That's it. That's where it is. The Prophet said in such beautiful clarity, everyone will be like the one they take as a close friend. You will follow the path and the way and the thinking process and the attitude of those you hang out with. So be aware and careful who you take as a close friend. A lot of people think their ideas are their own ideas. And they are just simply a product of environmental conditioning. And many of these people are Muslim, by the way. I will never listen to any other understanding or position or school of thought. We are right. We know. This attitude is not that of enlightened spirituality. This is just blind following of human beings. Even if it is true. It loses value. So, 
these people had good connections with their tribal status, with their aspirations of tribal Arab cultural history, and the Jewish uh, economic interests that they found with those around them. So they said, we're going to constantly work against these believers, and then one day we'll finally have this thing done in Medina. There will be no uh, reality of Islam in Medina, which they called Yathrib. They didn't like that it was called Medina, city of the Prophet. So, أَوْ كَصَيِّبٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فِيهِ ظُلُمَاتُ وَرَعْدُ وَبَرْقُ Or they're like a people. The hypocrisy is like people who are in a storm of pouring rain filled in the darkness. Thunder and lightning is clapping. يَجْعَلُونَ أَصَابِعُهُمْ فِي أَذَانِهِمْ مِنَ الصَّوَاعِقِ حَذَرَ الْمَوْتِ So they put their fingers in their ears anticipating the thunderclaps and the fear of death. Oh no, am I going to get hit by lightning? Is this whole thing going to kill me? Wallahu muhitum bil kafirin. God surrounds the disbelievers. So it's like a people, the scholar said like this, they said, imagine someone's traveling. They don't know where is what. And then this big storm hits. You're going to feel like, oh no, that's the end of me. So th they are scared, they have fear in them about this. And so they said that uh, they're fearing death and all of this because this storm that's coming seems like it's going to destroy them. A storm uh, for someone who's at home. If you're at home, what are you like? Well, it looks like the yard's going to grow. You see? You're going to get the fruits and vegetables are going to grow and all that good stuff. You know, you're in the safety of your house. So it's like patience through the trials of life and faith. You understand what it is. You have your home base. So your home is spirituality, where your soul came from. When you're not connected to your soul and you're connected to the earth, you're like some traveler who doesn't know what they're doing, what's going on. So when the storm comes, you don't see any benefit from it. You're not seeing benefit from this one. So, uh, the hypocrites are surrounded with what they believe is harmful because they are not at home while dealing with it. So, in this one, I'm trying to remember this other one I read by Imam Ibn Ashur. He's saying that this person is in this storm and he can see a little bit whenever the lightning strikes so he can see but because he's not at home it goes away and now he's so scared and he doesn't know which direction to go because it's dark out it's clouds and raining and all that so this person is just going to stay there until finally they may get hit by lightning whereas the believer they will be in a place of comfort and a place of safety because the word iman comes from amun which means safety of the soul. What do you think is most safe? Your home. Would you rather be out in the middle of nowhere in the dark where something bad could happen? Or would you rather be in your home safe and sound? So that's the soul is the home. And guidance will come like the rain pouring down. That is the... Uh, the thing that bears the fruits of life. But guidance brings masa'ib. There will be good and bad things. You will be tested through good and bad things throughout this life. If you're at home, you'll know what you're dealing with and you'll be able to, you'll be comfortable with it. Big thunderbolts, claps of lightning, all of that. You'll be comfortable with it. This is normal. These things should happen. The hypocrites whenever the reality hits and sets in that they don't know what they're doing and they've totally left home their reality is very dangerous the lightning almost snatches away their sight and whenever the light flashes they walk along and whenever it gets dark, they stand still. 
بِسَمْعِهِمْ وَبَصَارِهِمْ If God willed, He would have taken away their hearing and their sight. وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ And He is all-powerful. So the scholars have said that the lightning and the thunder represent the power of revelation. When revelation comes to you, you start to see things in your life. You see the favors of God, but at the same time you see your sins and the corruption in yourself and around you. This is like a lightning bolt hitting you. See, most people don't know they're sinning. Like if you look in our society today, and you see how basically the number one concern of most people is entertainment. Music, movies, sports games. How can I be entertained? It's like that Russell Crowe. Are you not entertained? They're watching him kill people live. But we're getting there, aren't we? I mean, now look. You know, like Hunger Games, you thought it sounded crazy. One thing you'll notice about Hunger Games is that they never mention God anywhere. Nobody's spiritual. Nobody believes in God. There's no churches, mosques, synagogues, nothing anywhere in that movie. It's a... It's looking forward the way we're going. Like the NFL right now. It's the biggest, most grossing uh, sport in the world. NFL. And yet, CTE. You know what CTE is? Uh, chronic uh, encephalopathy. It's the syndrome of concussions. You should go and get the movie Concussion, where Will Smith plays the Nigerian doctor who has four PhDs in different medical disciplines who was doing autopsies back in the year 2009 and 2008 on some famous football players who went crazy and their families asked for some sort of help. Will Smith said on NPR after he made the movie, I no longer watch the NFL. He said, I can't do it. He said, because I studied the whole thing about this. Right now they're showing, they did a research on 115 uh, dead NFL by the permission of their family. They posthumously uh, took them out of their grave, looked in their brains, and they found that 93% of all of those who died under 60, that 93% had this brain deteriorating concussion syndrome. And so what happens is right around the late 30s, early 40s, they start to get anger problems, they start to forget things, they start to have like uh, delusions, like they're hearing things and seeing things. They have very similar symptoms of schizophrenia, of dementia, and Alzheimer's. And then usually they start having chronic pain, and then they get on the opioids, and then they... Uh, start to have uh, problems with people around them and they start to become secluded and most of them commit suicide. Most of them are committing suicide. So you probably don't know as a result of this movie and what happened that uh, the NFL made a settlement of billions of dollars with thousands of families of people who had already had their stuff in court because they knew something was up. And the reason being is that they were, it was proven in the, with the evidence that the NFL has been knowing about this. And they've been hiding um, the knowledge. So our brothers, Hussein and uh, the Abdullah brothers, Hussein and uh, they're twins, I think. One pray, played for the Kansas City Chiefs, the other one played for... Yeah, they're both Abdullah. One's Hussein, one's... Uh, forgot his name. Astaghfirullah Azim. Those are some inspiring guys, mashallah. They both uh, quit the NFL. And the last one that quit, he said in, in uh, Facebook, he said, I started to notice these symptoms with my children that I used to not be like that. And now I'm having these feelings and interactions that I, I don't, you know, and it's being, it's there, my family's telling me. So I'm going to stop this before it gets any worse. So this is basically we're watching people destroy their lives. Most boxers go through this after some time. Um, so now, like, this is very, we're making money off the list. Like, what is this, the Colosseum back in it? But yet we're now modernized and we're, we're evolved people. No, we're not. We're going back to the same old stuff. Why? 
because of worldly attachments and desires. So the spiritual level that the believer is seeking is where I won't care how much money or how much fun I can make by worldly interests if it's going to hinder what is right spiritually. That's the believer's mindset, paradigm. The hypocrite and the disbeliever are saying, yeah, but I really enjoy these things in this worldly thing. I really want to make this like a home for me. I want to feel comfortable here. This is, this is a place, I need these people, I need these things, I need this enjoyment. It's very important for me. I thought it was crazy one time, whenever my, my uncle-in-law, he was telling his son who had been playing uh, some computer game for like eight hours all night. He was like, son, don't you know that uh, some Chinese and Japanese people are dying while playing the game? And I thought that was ridiculous. The brother sent me the actual article of real journalistic proof that some kids have been sitting urinating in plastic bottles and then dehydrating and die because they have to win this game. They die while playing a game. This is the value of life to these people. So that's really what we're talking about here. And so uh, life is going to bring trauma. It's going to bring difficulties. It's going to bring hardship. And we are meant to have some form of relaxation, what we call tarwihan and nafs. We are meant to have some relaxation. The Prophet ﷺ and his companions would sit and listen to some poetry. They would sit down and joke and, and talk about things in funny ways. Um, they would race camels and horses. This is not, they wrestled. But that was not like their ultimate goal. The modern society's model is you have to work really hard to barely make enough to feed your family. Like sometimes 10, 12 hours a day. And while the top 2% of society really doesn't do much work at all, and they just, the money just keeps piling up for them, right? And then when you finish, you should entertain yourself. Dancing with the stars. America's Got Talent. All of this. And all of these shows that they have. And you should be like, so Netflix, I didn't even know what it was. Netflix binging. Have you heard of this? Well, like college students take tests. There are college students. They took their test. They go home and they watch 25 episodes of a show over two days. What? This is, now these are educated people. These are some people, well, girls right here, they're praying five times a day, generally. Then they start doing like this. What are we doing? Where's reality in this one? The reality is fantasy land. So, um... Yeah. So if you're around the revelation, revelation is your, that's your home base. Spirituality is being fed through scripture, through prophet, through Quran. You're getting that. The people you're around, that's what they're thinking about. That's what they're remembering. Then that will keep you going in the right direction. When you detach yourself from it and then all of your influence is people who don't care. People who have turned their back. وَقَدَ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا دَسَّاهَا literally means like to put your head in the sand. Like to be like, I don't care. To turn your back on your soul. These are the failures in life. So I think that's... Uh, yeah. So, in summary, uh, the reality of the people of faith and their connection to spirituality and servitude to divine truth, connection to revelation. Disbelievers are people whose heart is blocked. It's, it's, it's uh, veiled. The heart of a disbeliever is veiled. They, they cannot see or hear or understand truth because they don't want it. Until their heart says, you know what God, I really am seeking genuine, honest guidance. Yeah, it's the uh, word done. So then the hypocrisy is where, uh, if you look at it, you'll see. The hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said that uh, whoever has one of these traits... Uh, has hypocrisy in them. Whoever has all four is a complete hypocrite. He said, the person that lies a lot. They live in a false world, what we were talking about. They invent false realities for what? For worldly benefit. The, so if we look, the Prophet had allowed some types of lying. Why? Because the person who's lying is not benefiting themselves with that lie, in any of these cases. 
Actually, they are causing benefit to others that carries an overriding need in society against, if he was just straight up, could cause some serious damage to those people. So the reality of lying is this uh, false reality based upon worldly interest. If you believe that God hears and knows all and angels are writing down your words, مَا يَلْفِظُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ Anytime you say something, there is an angel going to write down what you have said. And then on the Day of Judgment, your scale of worth will be there. So then he said the second, the second characteristic is, إِذَا uh, تُمِنَ khan. If these people are entrusted or given responsibility, they always uh, are treacherous. Or many times you'll find them, they never take care of this responsibility and they're never fulfilling their trusts. إِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفْ If they make a promise, they'll break their promise a lot. I will do that. And sometimes you're seeing Muslims throwing, I will do that, inshallah, and then they never do what they say after they say. I remember I was with a group of uh, kindergartners at Peace Academy a long time ago. I asked them, what does inshallah mean? And you know what the one kid said? Oh, I was going to start laughing. Probably not. <laughs> That's what the kid understood, he's kindergarten, five years old. I've been dealing with my dad, inshallah means probably not. And the theology of it, of the Surah Al-Kahf, as well as the, the theological understanding is that I am committing to a promise that I will do this. The only thing that will make me not do it is God's will that is beyond my reach. I'm driving to come to the time appointment I said. I'm going to be on time, I'm going to car crash. I did not no plan on that car crash. I did not know what was going to happen. I was going to do this for someone, and then some very bad thing happened. I had to take somebody to the hospital. I can't do it. I won't be able to do that. Some things are beyond your knowledge. That's why inshallah means. It means for sure, God willing. Meaning, I'm going to do it. I'm committing to it. But if God wills, then I can't. God does not will you to sit around at the house you know, jacking around, and then it's like 15 minutes after you said you would be there, then you leave the house. That is not God willing. That is you being lazy. So he said, uh, the fourth one is, إِذَا خَاصَمَ fajr. That when they get into a dispute with somebody, they flip out. Selfish. Full of their own desires. Worldly interest. Again, all of these people are doing whatever they're doing for selfish, worldly things which is of this world. Myself is not even mine. Our spiritual paradigm is uh, God owns me. He's allowing me to use me as a test. He's saying, look, here's the tijara. You take care of this body and this soul and this mind and this heart and all this stuff. And I will, if you come back to me having done that as your standard, and that's how you leave this world, I'll give you whatever you want forever. But if you say, I don't care, I'm not, you know, and make up false realities and follow your desires, then... So that's the hypocrisy. So, that's the three groups. There's only three groups. There's believers who believe in God and are seeking Him and are following Him and obedient and all of that. Then there are disbelievers. People say, I don't care, I don't want to believe in God, or I just want to follow whatever I follow, I'm not, I want to seek guidance. I like this, I don't like that, I pick and choose. And then the last one is hypocrisy where it seems like there's a contra contradiction or conflict. So the next tafsir class is going to be about the purpose of life. God is going to direct us with evidence. He's going to go right into evidence. This is who you are and who I am and how you should relate to me. And here's why. Isn't that the best way to do it? So he clarified the three groups. You could be this, you could be this, you could be that. Right now it may be that you're one of the three, you never know. But here is what I'm asking of you as the author of this revelation. And here's why. Here's the reasoning. Here's the proof. And so, um, now it gets into the manual of guidance as a system. Any uh, questions about hy hypocrisy or any of this stuff? It's hot in here, isn't it? Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Anytime you're in hot, just think, Alhamdulillah, I am here for spiritual things, I'm connected with God. 
if I do like that, then there's no hot going to come to me. La shamsa wa la zamharira. In the hereafter, there's no hot or cold. They're just perfect. So, um, yeah. Quick thing on the definition. So, you were saying the hypocrites are those who understand the faith and don't believe in it, or they are contradicting in their faith, they're not sure about it. So the brother is asking about what is the definition? So hypocrisy has varying levels, and that's where I've lost you. So hypocrisy, I think that also is ex bringing heat in it. <laughs> it's like a lucky. So yubtin al kufr wa yubhir al iman. That's what they said. Ba'tunuhu al kufr wa zahiruhu al iman. This is the fundamental worst case scenario of a hypocrite. That in their heart, they don't really believe. Outwardly, oh, I'm a believer, I'm with you, oh, okay. And they're doing this because of some interest. So like many of the world leaders of the Muslim community, the rulers of those places, a lot of the evidence is showing, and we're not judging individuals here, we're just saying a generality that we see, that there's a lot of them that really aren't really believers in Islam. But because they want those interests that World Bank and power and control and all the things that they get as leaders of the thing, um, they're using that. As, the, as their facade. And so, uh, and then unfortunately you have it in many families. And that's why I'm a, I'm a preacher of spirituality not being so us and them and so rigid and so forceful. When you tell your kid, you're a Muslim because we said so and that's it, and don't question it, they will form hypocrisy. You will cultivate hypocrisy in them. I'm not saying this because it's an opinion, it's not controversial, it is a fact. There are many people in Muslim families that have all kind of doubts and aren't sure if they're a Muslim inside. I've had some of them come out and say, okay, Imam, between me and you. Okay. And because, you know, there's a legal, uh, like a client privilege, it's the same as attorneys. If I was in a private meeting with anyone, and they said something in confidence, and said this is in confidence, and then I said it to somebody else, they can sue me and the organization. Right? It's a very serious thing. So, but mostly they don't know that. Usually it's youth and they just formed a good relationship. You know, this is what I've always thought and I just don't see if I, I don't think if I believe that, right? But I could never tell anyone in my family. So this is a big problem. Family should be a place where we can actually talk about anything. Because God has given us all freedom to think, isn't it? That is a fundamental reality of human reality. And even prophets were... God, what did Moses say? Let me see you. Does that sound like someone deeply faithful? Or is that someone like rationalizing God? He's rationalizing God. I would like to see you. God was like, okay. It's an interesting question. Let me show you how serious it is for someone in a finite world full of flaws. Check out that mountain. Right? You know the story. So, um, Abraham, he said... Yeah, show me how you raise the dead. That thing, that's some pretty crazy stuff, man. That's deep. I've never heard of anything like that. Show me how it's done. God didn't say, you are doomed to hellfire because how dare you question anything in religion. This is the modern religious talk. So that's where we need to be careful. We need to, be more, we need to not be so fearful. That's why that's why I, I get the feeling that a lot of parents aren't sure themselves about their religion, but they're culturally trying to preserve their... It's like cons, could the word conservatism... Many people think it means to stay on the right way. No, it means to stick with your forefathers. That's literally what it means. The concept of conservative, it means to follow your forefathers and what they've been doing for a long time and assuming that's the best and right conduct and way. What does the Qur'an have to say about that? Imam is turning the Qur'an into a liberal book. I'm not doing that. It's the way it is. It's the way the scripture says. And we have all these scholars... All these different methods with different opinions about everything. This is a liberal religion. It is. Alhamdulillah. Right? That is a mashallah. Ikhtilafum rahma. The scholar said. So, to answer your question, the bottom level is someone who's an absolute disbeliever in their heart and they're saying they're a believer for worldly interest and those people, inna al munafiqina fi dark al asfari min al nar. They're in the lowest level of the hellfire because they're the most corrupt, evil people. They're tre I mean, a disbeliever says, you know, I don't believe in Islam. But, you know, I can respect you as a person. I can work with that guy. We're all, you know, we're people, we're human beings. You have your belief, I have my belief. Lakum dinukum waliyadin. We respect you, we know where we stand. We know, you know, even the Trump person or whatever, racist or whatever. They're going to be like, yeah, well, at least I know where they're at. 
But when they're like, yeah, I'm on you, I'm with you, man. And then all of a sudden I find out they've stabbed me in my back. Those are the worst people, right? So, uh, and that's where, I don't mean to get too political, but we're going to edit this, inshallah. So many people think, oh yeah, Barack Obama was so awesome. And when you mean how he spoke and his general character and persona, yes, he was a very sophisticated, genuinely uh, acceptable leader of the great country of the world. But his policies, no way. His actions are just like Trump, actually. I'm telling you in so many ways. But we're being puppeteered. Look, why is this guy coming and acting like what's really the policy? <laughs> He's acting like that. He needs to do policies on the backside and then, you know, come out there and talk all presidential and everybody will accept him as a great guy. Yeah, so then, as, as we said, then there's the hadith at the top. Me and you, sometimes we fall into a situation of one of those four characteristics. We've got some hypocrisy. So we're believers. We're devout believers in our heart. But we're fighting against some spiritual disease in our heart. That's all of us. You know, we all go through that. So that is, so that when we say this, the Muslim says, I believe in Islam because there's one God. Muhammad was a prophet. He did all the miracles. Quran is the word of God. I believe that, so I think I should be praying and all that. I do my best, but maybe sometimes I don't. That's Muslim. Mu'min is like, you know what, I really believe this stuff. I'm really reading the Qur'an. I'm studying the tafsir. I'm going to the mosque throughout the week. I'm taking my family. I'm, you know, trying to find really pious, better people in faith than me so I can learn from them and be affected by them. That's the mu'min. The mu'min's really working hard. The mu'min will, by being mu'min, they're a searcher of spiritual security and safety through revelation, through environment, through attitude on life. That person will get rid of all of these and there will be no hypocrisy. And then the muhsin is one who's just, they're just walking around, very few people on earth, and they just, everything they do is for the sake of God. They don't fall into any of it. Those are, when you meet them, it's like, Allah Akbar. So, yes, brother. So the category of people who genuinely believe Islam is evil because of the Fox News or they got bad experience with Muslims, or for a group of people, like somebody who's been video game all his life, he doesn't know about Islam. Where do they fall? Well, these are, now we're talking about disbelievers. That's a whole other, but in the category of disbelievers, um, so here's an interesting point. How many of you heard Prophet Muhammad was sent to mankind, and now so anyone who does not embrace him is doomed to hellfire? How many of you heard that? Yeah. Raise your hand. Come on, come on. Let's, let's see. It. Okay, there you go. Most, pretty much all of you, okay? <laughs> And this is not just. This is not just. And it's in conflict with so many verses and so many hadith. It's going back to the same reason why the parents do their kids like that and they act like they're scared that their kids are going to become Christian or disbelievers just because they're exposed to or having a discussion about some difficult topics. It's like a lack of real faith. Like for me, if my kid comes to me, like for example today, my kid came to me saying that the teacher said that Israel, they showed us a map in world history, and they said this is Israel, and I said what about Palestine, he said there's no such thing as Palestine, there never has been, Israel is that, it turns out he's a Zionist Jew, he's the teacher. Assalamu alaikum. So, my son was like, you know, but Baba, we talked about this and everything, and so I told the teacher that, you know, actually there was these people there, and they're mostly Muslim and Christian, and they've been pretty much wiped out over the last many years since this Israel was created on top of their land. And he was like, yeah, this is a deep discussion and all of that. So my son's like, we've got to have a deep discussion. I want to debate my uh, world history teacher. That's better, you know. Many parents would say, son, don't talk about these things with him. Just don't talk about it. Stay away from it. Get your A's in the class. Why? We stand for something. And we're, we're comfortable with it. We know what we know. If we can learn something, maybe he teaches me some. He's not on this issue. He's not because I've spent hundreds of hours on it. I'm sure he's been raised with an idea because I've met some of the rabbis that were raised with the idea. They've never studied it. They just raised. This is how it is. So those people who are saying, I don't really know anything about Islam except for what I saw on Fox News or CNN or MSB, blowing up and chopping heads off and burning people alive, drowning them alive. That's what I see as Islam. Crazy bearded guys on something preaching death to the West or whatever. 
If that's all they know, are we all expecting them to say, wow, now that I know the ba'a of this religion, I should study it. Maybe it's a potential faith I should embrace. Who thinks that's reasonable? Raise your hand if you think that's what they should be doing. Like it or not, Imam, we don't have our mayor in here. Okay. So, that is not a fair assessment. Interestingly enough, how many of you, while you were being raised by your Muslim parents, your uh, parents said, look, we feel very comfortable about what we know about the Prophet and Islam and the Qur'an, but we encourage you to go study other faiths now that you're a teenager. And so you should go study other religions and then come to a conclusion about your faith based upon true conviction. How many of your parents said like that? MashaAllah. <laughs> My parents were like that. I teach my kids that way. And um, it's working out because we're having real discussions that need to be had. And it's not something hidden and then they meet some really cool person that seems really influential and then my parents, I know I can't talk to them about this and then they really, really like that person going back to hypocrisy and then they just go, go along with them. When he's around me, he's Muslim. When he's around them, he's not Muslim. So those people, God will judge them. It's not our business. Um, could they go to heaven? Yes, they could go to heaven if they died in that state. We don't know. Will we pray for them and go, you know, like that? No, because they're not from our ummah. The thing about ghusl and janaza and graveyards, this is so we all know where we stand in this life for worldly religiosity, so that the lines aren't blurred. Everybody's not the same. Some people said this, some people said that. Allah is the judge, right? God will judge the hearts where they were. Were they sincere towards their creator, feeling accountable for being blessed with life and a knowledge of right and wrong and a moral decision to make about that or were they like yeah I don't care I'll just do whatever I want to do I didn't have any interest to learn anything and then you know and there's famous hadith on this that is uh, mentioned in the tafsir of وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبَعْثَ رسولا. Um, God will never punish anybody until he sends them a messenger so the, many of the scholars have said sending a messenger so for example um, was it enough for the Arabs that Jesus had been sent or did Allah need to send Muhammad right amongst them someone from among them right so it had to be done like that and so for the people of America they need to meet real Muslims they need to get to know and see like that and then it will be something more accountable people are accountable for what they know um, and, if they, and if in their heart they had said I don't care to know then that's very serious um, so the kid that's just playing video games and all that, it just depends on where their heart is. But it's not our business to say who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. And it's not our business to claim for sure we're going to heaven. Of course, if we are dedicating our life to regular prayers and remembrance of God and uh, you know, following the message as it was revealed, we feel very comfortable and we have a very strong hope that I'm ready to die and I'm comfortable with that because I'm doing what's asked of me. And when I have slipped up, I ask forgiveness and try to move away from that evil. So... Um, but yeah, we can't say about anybody who dies where they're going to go. Um, uh, this is a funny thing. We've got to pray. We're going to make our done right now. But uh, I was giving a khutbah in, uh, in Florida. And I, talk, I was talking about faith and the value of faith and the power of the shahada. Did you guys see Saddam Hussein get hung? Yes. Yeah. What was his last words? Two times we heard it. We didn't hear anything else than we saw him home. We call it a husn khatma. Now if you're Iraqi, you don't care what you heard from him, he's going to hellfire. You've made that decision. Based upon oppression, torture, abuse, humiliation, uh, all of that kind of stuff. They lived through it for many, many decades. But what we know spiritually from theology, it looks like he's going to heaven. Somebody who until the last moment they came to it. Some scholars would say, well, he knows he's going to die. But he could have said anything. He said, Hezbul Ba'ath. He could have said that, right? But he came to faith at this point. And does he know that somebody's not, American forces aren't going to come in? All right, that's enough. You know? I don't know, it sounds like a movie, huh? But he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. But he's being sure about what he knows spiritually. Um, so this is where, you know, spirituality is a very interesting, delicate, multifaceted, nuanced thing. It's not a rigid, uh, 
monolith type thing. It's a very sophisticated reality that needs to be respected and treated as such. And people need to stop trying to control God and religion. Okay? We know what has been revealed. We know the prophet. We are believing in that. But when it comes to all of the knowledge of that and the correct interpretation and what's going to happen in the hereafter by detail and for surety, Allahu Akbar. That's the, that's the reality of the believers. But some people are like, this is what it is, I'm on the haqq, I'm on the truth, those are the kuffar, I'm this, those are the you know, fusaq and the fujur and the bid'ah. I mean, this is the Saudi thing, I don't know how far it's going to last. It needs to get, somebody needs to do something with it. It's way out of control. So, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his guidance, we ask his forgiveness, and we ask his uh, support in our endeavors, inshallah.